49ers game day back in action. It's Monday. Some stuff happened since we've last talked on Wednesday. Uh, I'm starting to think that our, our Monday, Wednesday situation might not be the best spacing. Maybe we go Thursday. doesn't matter. Uh, we're going to do my three-round draft pick week. today. And we're going to talk some some stuff that happened in free agency because Jake's got the numbers. Jake has the low down and dirty. And yeah. I feel like we've been misled by the national media. That's, that's all I got. It turns out um, those numbers we got are all lies. And cool. no one's actually making as much money as anyone says. The Colt McKivitz deal isn't really... One year, seven million dollars. Uh, Jordan Elliott didn't get two years, ten million. It's more like two years, five and a half million. Just, um, just a little bit of a difference there. Yeah, and Yitor Yitor Gross Matos is uh, not two years, eighteen million. Um, so what is and, and all that money? Matos? Even if it is that much, like it it is so easily cuttable. Whatever numbers come out, never trust them. And we didn't trust them, but they're still lower than we expected. Yeah, yeah. Well, uh, and. The Niners didn't go out and get that number two corner that I was looking for. Uh, they, At they least added yeah. Isaac Yadam. Um, yeah. Not, not bad. I mean, listen, it, it seems to me as if the 49ers have looked at everything that happened last season, have uh, looked forward to this season and said, you know where we were really deficient? Special teams. <laughs> that's that's the difference because they are yeah. just, I don't know if the money's real or not, but they are just flashing cash on special teams, Jake. Dude, they're they're making moves. So just just to go through special teams, they re-signed Demetrius Flanagan Fowles uh, to a one-year, almost two million dollar deal. They retained George Odom on a big special teams deal, about two years, ten-ish million. Probably not going to be that much. Uh, right. They added Chase Lucas uh, from the Lions, who it's got into, a, I believe, a fight with uh, Diamador Lenore at the end of their you game. No, he did. And I'm they like, why do Ezekiel I know that Turner. name Chase Lucas? And I went back in my notes and I'm like, wow, Chase Lucas, he had a special teams air in the NFC championship game. So mm-hmm. the Niners are like, this is our guy. This guy knows how yeah. to play Niner football. And then, yeah, he got, got into a fight with the Amador Lenore. It's pretty good stuff. And that's important. That's important. Got they also support. added. Right. You got you got to be fair. If you're going to be a special teamer, like we talked about with Odom, you could be a little insane and kind of want to fight everybody after a yeah. kickoff that doesn't get returned. That's you know, right. you kind of need to have that edge to you. George right. Odom has it. That's and no Chase Lucas seems to have it too. They also, I will say, they added Ezekiel Turner. Mm-hmm. I know very little about him. Special teamer. And no Yadam, who is coming off a career year. Like a genuinely pretty stellar year with the Saints. After okay. sort of bouncing around 99 overall pick in the 2018 draft. You know. And then last year, he played outside corner and played extremely well. Was uh, out of, you know, PFF is not the end all be all, but he was the 12th graded corner out of 133 qualified corners, pass rating 84.4 against, ranked 40th. Like he had a legitimately good coverage season as an outside corner and plays special teams. I think the 49ers are thinking kind of like when they brought in Jason Verrett, mm-hmm. high upside, pretty low risk. Even if he doesn't start on the outside, he can play special teams. I think that's a really, really intriguing signing, especially mm-hmm. if they think, let's go safety. Let's go premium on a safety and free agency instead of outside corner, and then we'll draft another corner in the draft. I can get behind that. Um, again, when you have figured out your DT spot to a degree with Malik Collins, you like what you have a defensive end. I don't, but they do. Um, you now did bring in Devondre Campbell, so the weak side linebacker that you had and then you didn't have, now you have a weak side linebacker again. You could do a whole lot worse than Devondre Campbell, and we all knew that was going to be a weird spot. With You were going to have to bring yeah. in an over-the-hill veteran just because it's like, hey, you're the starter for a month. Like We need you to be capable right. of starting because Jalen Graham, as excited as everyone is about him, there's a reason he wasn't on the field. There's a reason they didn't put him right. on the field last year. He could be that guy, but you need to at least have a competition in training camp to see if he's that guy. You can't just give that kid the role. So if Campbell is your backup, right? Campbell's the guy, you know, Graham beats him out. He's your starter for the first month. Then you have Campbell as your backup. You're feeling good. Reverse it. You're feeling pretty good. And then, oh, yeah, Dre Greenlaw should come back. And this gives Dre Greenlaw, in theory, we'll see in practice, but in theory, gives Dre Greenlaw plenty of opportunity to get 100% right. He's not right. having to rush back from an Achilles injury um, because a couple of days ago, it looked like 
uh, can you play with one leg, young man? Because we would really need right. you to hop around out there and try to make something happen. What's what's especially funny about the Eric Kendricks deferring or defecting to go to the Cowboys is yeah. I believe he was the first outside signing the Cowboys made. Um, right. One of the they're all in my most they're all the in. Cowboys are awesome because I hope somebody just clips that and goes what um, they are awesome. The Cowboys they're really are good for the league. They they do this incredible thing where they are genuinely elite at drafting. They yes. have incredible homegrown talent year after year after year. Mm -hmm. And then in free agency, they go out and they sign no one. No one whatsoever. Yep. And Jerry Jones just drives all of their fans crazy. He wants to remain relevant, but refuses to spend unless it's an over-the-hill linebacker who is like, I'll take more money. With yeah, the Cowboys to, go play, for, to go play for Mike Zimmer, to be fair. Who he doesn't he like. Was, well, apparently he, he was successful in that system. Right. And you know that they're just going to run the same Mike Zimmer shit that they ran in Cincinnati and they ran in Minnesota. Like, get this. They're going to have linebackers in the A-gap. It, it, it's coming. And they had to yeah. cut up. I think they cut Van Der Esch this week so uh, or the past week. So they needed linebackers. I'm sure they threw a little bit more money. And Kendricks is thinking, I can start all year. For the Cowboys right. in a system I know, or I can be in a battle to start for a month with a, a kid who is a six round draft pick or whatever. So uh, I don't blame him for going anywhere. I do blame the 49ers no. for not getting pen to paper before Wednesday. So that, that is what it is. Uh, anything else pop out at you with with what the 49ers have done in free agency uh, in terms of maybe even macro concepts? Like, does this show you anything? about how they're going to attack the draft? Does it show you anything about who they trust maybe more than the fan base trusts? I think it does a little bit. I think, you know, my thought on the special teams thing is, do they know something we don't? Do they have confidence that this rule change where I don't know if it's going to go through, I don't know if anyone's really reported on it, other than that, well, it's going I, to the I've, I've talked to a couple of people about it. The my understanding of the situation, and we'll see if this turns out to be accurate or not, because it's not like anybody's coming at this from a, a stance of like really strong opinion, right? Like right. no one's coming at this saying like, I, I've got the lowdown. This is all I think about. This is all I talk about. But right. it does sound to me just asking around like there's a lot of pork on the bill, if that makes any sense for those oh, who yeah. kind of know politics. Yeah. Like the the XFL kickoff rule, which is I think the the brunt of what we're talking about here, is Correct. no one can go anywhere until the ball is caught. And then the guys line up a little closer as to make it look kind of normal. So instead of teams getting 40-yard running head starts to go bash the hell out of the, right. the kick returner, they're in fact starting, I think it's like 30 yards apart from each other. Uh, I could be wrong on that, but they're starting a lot closer. And it's more like a, it's almost like a punt, though not in right. actual practice. where the It guy feels more the like a... Yeah, it feels more like uh, after safety, like that sort That's of right. That's kickoff, right. the punt yeah. kickoff. So there's, it, it's just, it, it's a little delayed. It's not going to be as full force. Right. And in that, they think they can get people to actually return kicks. Now, right. there's also then they added on like a new touchback rule. And the touchback rule, I don't think actually has legs to it. And then there's another two things that were added on to it. Yeah. And, and I don't have it in front of me, but like, it's all part of the same package. Like that's the thing they're voting on. So you're not just right. voting, you know, to steal, go back to the metaphor. You're not just voting on like extending benefits for veterans. You're also voting on a bridge outside of Pittsburgh and, uh, right. you know, like uh, capital right. gains tax. We loved, changes. we love to add a rider about where you can uh, plant flowers and they're apparently you can only plant them next to a sewer. That's so right. That's, it gets very HOA sort of very like. fast. And uh, I I have lived, save for one year of my life, away from HOAs for a reason. Uh, very. Yeah. I guess I guess I'm small government, but uh, it's it's regardless. It, it sounds like there might be too many riders because I think there is yeah. a, a I do get the sense anyone who talks about this thing publicly, this this XFL kickoff rule goes, oh, that's a great idea. We should do that. And right. maybe there do need to be a couple of things on top of it as because you can't just make that one little shift. It's such a big change. You do need to add a couple of things. But it seems as if the things that are added are not germane to the actual kickoff rule. So I'm not sure it's going to pass. Right. Also, I believe you need three quarters of a vote from the league 
to you need you I know, think like, that's I think that's also, right. It's either, like a constitutional yeah. amendment. Uh, we're really getting into civics today here on 49ers game day. Uh, important. So uh, everybody who everybody watches what does your NFL Rock government do for you? <laughs> yeah, right. Roger Goodell. I actually we're going to I'm going to go way off track here. There was a part of me at the Super Bowl that went, I think Roger Goodell should run for president of the United States. Wow. Everyone would hate him. I'm not sure anyone would vote for him. But he but could I probably whip think, some votes. I, I think he'd get the goddamn job done. His dad was a senator. I, I think he I, I think you could do a whole lot worse. Than Roger Goodell as the president of the United States, because if we're ta- people say The Rock or like you know this dipshit right. who with an IQ of eighty but does a lot of steroids <laughs> should do it. Like The Rock can't even run a football league for a year. The XFL exploded. I get that the pandemic happened, and I know that they're coming back. But like, what, what are we talking about here? Roger Goodell, meanwhile, has taken over the NFL, which was in great stead. It should be said has garnered it through like three of its biggest crises ever. He took all the bullets on that one, as yep. a good leader does. Just just took them. Just took them. And he made mistakes. There's no question about it. But he just took the bullets, garnered the league through, and now it makes as much money as like anything, anything in this country. I think it's like the one right. solid business in America. Yeah. So you could do a whole lot worse. I'm, I'm in Vegas at the Super Bowl. I'm going, I hate Las Vegas, but damn, they can put on a show. And that That's dude true. did not answer a single question straightforwardly during his... 90 minute press conference which like look at the difference i think a good commissioner um look at the difference between Goodell yep. and mlb's commissioner in just right. the way you answer questions Goodell doesn't and rob Manf- rob manfred answers too many and he's most right. of the time wrong i think there's also just something to be said if you're looking at the three major commissioners in sports i mean gary bettman's no longer really part of this because gary bettman's like proven to be kind of a shitty commissioner just doesn't have any vision doesn't have anything for it but like okay adam silver is just petrified of the players in the nba so all he's done is kowtow to the players and the players he he gave him an inch they took a mile and now the league is entirely player run and guess what that's not going to go so well because once lebron and steph retire there's no clear-cut superstar to sell it's got to be it's got to be wemby he's got to bet everything on you're betting you're betting on a seven foot four French kid. I mean, yeah, right. I think Wemby's incredible. Like from a basketball perspective, sorry to anyone who is like strictly football, but you, you knew what you were signing up for with this podcast. That's uh, like and from a straight basketball perspective, Wemby is incredible. He's impossible. Uh, I'm not sure he's box office because he's so dominant. Like is Wilt Chamberlain mm. getting put? You know, oh, like like Duncan, like Duncan just being like elite. I think it's almost more know, like Shaq. Shaq. I, like mm. it, it's to the point where it's so much better than everybody else. If he ever puts on the weight, like he'll be so much better than right. everybody else, but it's obvious why he's so much better than everybody else that people will just take it as a foregone conclusion and it won't be entertaining or exciting because people like things that they can't explain. People don't like the, uh, I heard Jack White say this. He says he really likes movies and songs that he doesn't know the conversation that led to them. Mm. He doesn't understand how they got here. Like when he hears a song and he's like, oh, they added the reverb there. This is a knockoff of that riff that, and I I relate to this with a lot of stuff like that bothers him because now he's thinking about the process of making it more so than the actual product. And I know that that's not everybody's mindset, but at some point everybody taps into that. And right. With Wemby, it's just like, how could you not see why he's the best? He's seven foot four. He has a nine I, seven. I disagree. Reach. I think he is like. I think when I watch Wemby, I'm like, I've never seen that before. It's a novelty you know? now. Will it be a novelty later? Novelty, I don't I think, think so. I think I think he's going to keep doing weird stuff that no one tries before, like the weird running, no look back yeah. over his head shots. He's awesome. That it's like everybody forgot what the hook shot is, and he's like, wait, why wouldn't I just? use this all the time he's gonna get some weird running sky hook from the three-point line okay i'll say this because my i have a larger point that i've made a million times on radio (laughs) and in print and whatever which is the nba doesn't have a next american star after steph and lebron and that it's bad luck for them that feels like anthony edwards is the best option and it's where the video (laughs) like not anymore (laughs) Not anymore. Right. Um, maybe in five years we'll forget. Maybe not. Uh, but that didn't work out for him. Jason Tatum 
that's why I think the entire league is like, hey, we, we got to have the Celtics win the title this year because it's got it's Jason Tatum or bust. But you say stuff like the novelty, and we will get back to football, I promise. We will. The novelty and of special it, teams. And especially special teams. The novelty of uh, Wemby, like Nikola Jokic has that currently. Like I, I, I get that Luka Doncic yeah. is just like the the next iteration of James Harden um, and all this. But like Luke, you, you watch Nikola Jokic, he is the most fun. Ex- he doesn't jump. He's just out there just giving work. Every he's the YMCA king, just the guy where you, he can't move and he's totally. just hitting every single shot. They can't sell Nikola Jokic. I've talked to enough people at ESPN and Turner that they're like, we can't get ratings with this dude. We can't do it because there's nothing to latch on to with the American public. It, 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 he, he's, yeah. I don't think that it's it, 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 uh, negative or insidious or anything like that. Like, I don't think that there's a, a strict prejudice against it. They just don't know this guy. And even now that they do know him, it just it doesn't rate. It doesn't rate because he's not right. American. And he doesn't have that American personality, sort of the big brash thing that we get knocked for overseas and stuff. Wemby, I don't think is going to have that either. Wemby seems like he's way too well adjusted to be the kind of American star you want. And when you go, okay, LeBron, well, LeBron has sold a lot, but LeBron's greatness has required him to not have that much personality. And all he's done in the last mm. 10 years is try to say, I'm so, I have so much personality. And you're like, yeah. It's fine. Space Jam sucked. Um, Steph, his entire public shtick is boy next door. Like, what a great guy. Like, I'm going to run for president. Mm-hmm. By the way, again, Roger Goodell better than Steph Curry in that regard. Um, like, it, Especially as it comes to housing. <laughs> don't start. I won't. Fight I won't. <laughs> but, uh, start with <laughs> so, <laughs> big NIMBY Steph. Uh, regardless, uh, Roger Goodell, meanwhile, is building stadiums in towns all over the country. He's a he's a Yimby. Uh, regardless, like Steph also is just the most spectacular player you could ever see because of the three point shot. And it's this new thing and it's all this great right. stuff. I just think they're gonna have a big issue with this. And when you count out of the players, like now he can't pull back control. And then in baseball, he's uh, Rod, uh, uh, Rob Manfred is all about the owners. He's a former labor lawyer. The reason he has the job isn't because he had a vision for baseball. The reason he had the job is because he was the lawyer for all the teams. And the right. next commissioner is going to be the lawyer for all the teams. They don't care about anything other than the collective bargaining agreements. And they win every time, which is fine. And I think part of that, a lot of that has to do with how bad the Players Association is run. And you see stuff like what happened with J.D. Davis the other day. Right. And it's like, that's not Major League Baseball's fault. That's the that's the players' association's fault. How do you not right. negotiate something like that? How do you not see those loopholes? Tony Clark's really bad at his job, and Rob Manfred's walked all over him. Goodell, I do think, while he does work for the owners, that's his job. He's the lawyer for the owners. I do think he has the the, the betterment of football. He understands that a rising tide lifts all ships. That right. the sport itself has to be healthy in order for the owners to be healthy. And while he's covered up for a lot of shitty owners over the years. Uh, fiscally in a lot of ways. I mean, to the point of billions of dollars, he does have the sport in mind when he makes moves and uh, right. you know, changing the rules every year. Every year they change the rules because if you're not evolving, you're right. dying. And I mean, here's the th- yeah, he he runs a sport that, yeah, it sells itself. But like, you could watch a random NFL game between the Jaguars and the Cardinals and be entertained. Totally. The, the floor level of an NBA regular season game that mm-hmm. to make it watchable is exponentially higher. Some of That's that is just, just the floor. baseline schedule, right? Like yeah. there's one game a week. And I, I see this right. a little bit with, you know, soccer in Europe where it's like, it's one game a week. You have some time to build up to it. You think about it, you're moving forward. Um, I, I, I regardless, I think Roger could, you could do a whole lot worse. And I, I, I would hope that Goodell would just say, we're doing this anyway. Like we're gonna right. cut this thing off. I'm, I'm I- executive mandate. We're gonna do this kickoff rule. And to your point, which you made about ten minutes ago, to my apologies. I, lo- I love this. This is one of our all time tangents, and we're and we're bringing it all the after this tangent. We're bringing it back to special teams, which is my harebrained theory that the 49ers have invested in special teams with the idea that this rule change will come into effect where you get Flanagan Fowles, George Odom, Chase Lucas, Ezekiel Turner, Isaac Yadam. Really good tacklers or really good special teams players to go out there because 
the theory, right. I, I suppose, here would be that because they won't have the kind of running start they used to, there's going to be more kickoff kickoff returns. And if there are yeah. more kickoff returns, you need dudes who can make plays in the open field as a as a defender. Right. That, that's right. the idea. Right. And regardless, they were not reliable on coverage last year on special teams. Like they looked they like they didn't. I don't think they allowed a touchdown, but they allowed some kickoff long returns. returns yeah. That just the coverage looked wrong. It, it was like guys were getting sealed and there would be, you know, you got Tabor Pepper running for his life trying to tackle somebody, which I will say Tabor Pepper, as far as long snappers go, he really does like to try and make a play. Good for him. Um, but, you know, you would like your other guys who were meant to make tackles to be yeah. making tackles. So Yeah, I love that theory. The special teams corner slash commissioner, <laughs> president, housing, politics corner of our I mean, it's the most game day segment, segment we've ever had if we're being honest. i love it i think we should i think we should bring it back as a recurring segment <laughs> just deeter on some just harebrained tangent that's 15 points away and jake that's coming great. up with a grand theory about special teams if that ain't game day i don't know what is um anything else we want to get to before i get to my my three round mock draft which you'll do on wednesday and it'll be a lot right. better than mine but do you right. have any other thoughts well i we'll see um yeah, I mean, all the state of politics, or <laughs> it's cra- it's crazy out there. Uh, I will I will just go through real quick and just yeah. mention so far what I have, and I may miss somebody, but additions: Leonard Floyd, Jordan Elliott. Again, more like a two five and a half year deal than a two year ten million By the deal. Way, th- that changes everything. Huge. When it was two ten, and you're like, "What the fuck are they doing?" That's right. one thing. When it's Jordan Elliott 2-5, I'm still not like a fan of his play, but at least there's right. no you can cut him. You can yeah. literally cut this dude before the season starts. And this you year, made a mistake, but not a correct. big one. This year it's a two million two point one million dollar cap hit. If they cut him, they take on an additional hundred eighty five thousand dollars. They cut uh Nate Sudfeld for that amount. Two million. Basically. And we're just like, sure. They paid Nate, whatever. Nate Sudfeld two million to go away. They've paid Nate right. Sudfeld more than Brock Purdy has made the last two years to go away for Brock Purdy. Right. And they could do that with Jordan Elliott. And next year it would be three and a half million. If they want to cut him, they'd save a million and a half. It doesn't matter. The point is the money is actually inconsequential. It's not two years, 10 million where you're like, that's a guy that you need to count on. This is yes. like, oh, we're actually intrigued by him. He's a rotational piece. If he's not good enough in camp, We'll cut him, and it will have not been a great move, but it won't right. be damning. That's true, and especially, too, when you consider where they were at with defensive tackle. Like, yeah, you do have to bring in bodies. You had to bring in bodies, and it didn't make any sense to bring in Jordy, Jordan Elliott as a player to count on because yeah. you go, okay, you're going to, you know, Malik Collins had to have been in the works for a couple of days. So you go, right. okay, Malik Collins. And there were rumblings that it, there was a Malik Collins for Eric Armstead deal that didn't work out. Because uh, I forget who the Texans added at defensive end, but that's why it didn't work out. But yeah, you're right; that was in the works. They added Danielle Hunter. Um, yeah, and they they felt like they were really solid up the middle, and they didn't want to pay Malik Collins eight million dollars. And the 49ers were like, "Shit, we'll take him." Um, and right. uh, that worked out. Can we talk about Eric Armstead for a second? Three years, yeah, fifty-one million from it. the Jacksonville Jaguars. Yeah. Um, good for Eric. He won. He won in the breakup between the 49ers and Eric Armstead. I'll tell you who lost, though, the Jacksonville Jaguars, because this feels like that's going to be a real problem for them. I get that they have to spend money. I get that they're in a position to compete and win today um, in that division. And I get what Eric Armstead could bring you. And uh, I don't think you're going to get it from him at that number. There's a reason the 49ers asked him to take a pay cut. And three years, fifty-one for a dude with bad feet coming off a meniscus injury. I mean, and probably is more of yeah. a four-eye technique than a one, or certainly a seven. Like, oh boy, um, I, I saw that number and I went, "Good for Eric. He'll enjoy Jacksonville just fine." Uh, but I, I, I don't see the vision there from the Jags and Trent Balky. It's a lot. It's a lot. I think they're desperate for help up the middle, and they think if they can get like even a 14 15 game armstead for two years yeah and maybe they make the playoffs well first of all to make the playoffs you have to not collapse in pretty uh mets new york mets like fashion yeah but i think they think if they can get that sort of production out of him and rely on him in the run game 
and as a pass rusher, just as a force that they don't really have. Mm -hmm. I see where the bet is. It is a lot for a guy who's going to be 31 coming off, who's had foot 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 injuries, plantar fasciitis, which anyone who, to go back to the NBA, anyone who knows the NBA and guys who deal with plantar fasciitis, the bigger you are, the more of a recurring problem it is. And it's really killed some careers in the NBA where it just doesn't go away. And sometimes it's fine, but sometimes it's, it's damning. And especially after the meniscus thing, it's, it's a risk. It's a real, real risk. Bill Walton once told me for big men, when their feet go, the whole thing goes. And I, yeah. I, I thought about that every day when I, I see Eric Armstead in the locker room, when I see him play. I mean, because Eric Armstead's six foot seven, 315 pounds. Your boy is the same size. Now, Eric Armstead's <laughs> putting it in better, better positions and all that. He's, you know, he got $51 million for being that. And here I am. You know, you guys never went. Asshole. You guys never went one on one against each other. You never. You never got a, won. got a little got a little he jump set. He would have won. There's some guys that every now and again I'm like, oh, I could win one out of ten reps against an NFL. Wow. Player. There's as as an offensive lineman, I'm like, I can see. Anchor. This is this is much more logical. Dieter at least has his size, whereas I uh, my my old take that I could I could be like a a slot receiver. And and here's a, the caveat is that yeah, I would have to be crazy. To be a slot right. receiver, you'd have to be you'd have to be hit in the head a few times. I would have to be not myself. Football. That's right. So innately, I wouldn't be able to do it. But I'm part of me is like I could have, I could have, I got that burst off the line. I got a great 10 second split. I, I it's to the point where I really hope they draft Lad McConkey or bring in like Hunter yeah. Renfro as uh you know kind of a training camp flyer. Which I don't think you. I think he'll actually get like a real job. But like if he were to, I just want Jake to have to see a tiny white guy play slot and be like yeah you're not doing that like this guy's sick yeah (laughs) not even the physical aspect just the like athleticism and first dylan lowby baby yeah that's right well maybe maybe that's the one that can get you over the hump running backs a whole other level of crazy yeah meanwhile i walk through a a locker room and i'm like i'm much larger than you guys in some cases like the only the only offensive lineman that i have been physically in awe of (laughs) is trent and Trent is like four inches shorter than me, but there's an aura. There's just this like halo of like, oh, you don't fuck with that dude. For for those of you, by the way, who did not read the story about Trent Williams' locker, Trent had a Eric situation. In the Chronicle. It's and it's funny to read a story about it, but it is really like it does say a lot about Trent's presence. Where he basically he he had two lockers. And it, then it became three where I, I forget. I th- Oh, it was Kerry Hyder was next to him and Kerry right. Hyder got cut. And so Trent took over the locker. Meanwhile, and there's all these practice it. got squad guys like sharing like a little locker. Yeah. Trent takes over a second locker. And then there's another one that's just for basically his shoes. Yeah. And then there's like one of those ropes, like when you're in an airport. In he the legitimately line. has a velvet rope in front of his locker. And a velvet carpet, too. That's right. Um. And, and it's not like velvet carpet, silverback 71. Right. And you're not like, oh, yeah, yeah. And his name tag, it's, there's Williams at the top and then it's silverback on yeah. the other one. Yeah. And there's there's at no point where you're like, oh, this is kind of weird. You're like, he he's earned this. He deserves this. And it actually is fitting, you know, because it's it's yeah. If he was, if he was an actual asshole, like he, right. he, out there on the field, he's the meanest, baddest dude who's ever lived. Uh, right. He did not have a good Super Bowl, we should note, uh, regardless. Um, if he wasn't like a really, he's not the easiest guy to talk to, but he's always been kind. Like, I think he's like a right. kind person with the media, which is deeply appreciated. You don't have to be. Right. You're trying and, and it's it's often like, I think when he's like exhausted and there's yeah. a million people, he's, but he does, he always. He'll tell you. Takes the time to talk. And when yep. you ask a good question or something that he finds entertaining, he is like a human about it. He, he doesn't about it. Yeah, he thinks about it. He's earnest and yeah. he gives you an answer. Uh um, I mean, to be fair, it was it's just sheer unspoken intimidation that allowed him to get three lockers. That you want right. to talk about taking it giving an inch, <laughs> taking a mile. Trent Williams is like, this is mine now. And you're like, okay. Right. It was a real Debo I, move. I, not Debo Samuel. Yeah, I think Debo there was a Friday. player. 
I think there was a player that's like, really, you're going to tell Trent? Well, maybe that was Kyle. It was like, really, you're going to tell Trent he can't have three lockers? Well, what was what um, was George Kittle's quote? He can have as many lockers as he wants. Right. <laughs> <laughs> they liter- The 49ers literally brought in additional lockers into the locker room, which, by the way, it, it, for those who don't know, the 49ers locker room is actually in the stadium. So their practice right. facility is next to Levi's Stadium. And they use the actual locker room in Levi's Stadium every day, regardless game right. or practice. And that's their nice locker room. And it makes sense. Um, maybe a little bit of cost savings on the front end. But, like, why build a second nice locker room or a worse locker room 150 right. yards away? So they use that locker room every day. And, uh, yeah, it, it, they, it, it's, it's a well-structured locker room. We've been in a lot of locker rooms. I've been in a lot of uh, home locker rooms across the NFL. Most of the time, they're somewhat temporary because their facility is 50 miles outside of town. So the Niners did a nice job with this, and they were really thoughtful on how to lay out the locker room. So every locker is around the edge, and then there's a couple that are in the middle, but there's a lot of space. They clearly got the tape measure out and figured out, you know, make sure we have enough space between these lockers in the middle versus on the side, and it's a big room. And the 49ers, when they had a lot of guys on the team, because as you get deeper in the season, you just have more dudes because some guys are injured and might be coming back. you got guys on IR. you got guys that – you know, are, are gone for the year, but they still get a locker because they still come into work. Um, they just brought in like eight extra lockers and had to figure out how to configure them because Trent Williams just kept taking more and more space. And uh, good, good on him. He can have whatever he wants at this point. What is he, 30, 37 years old? And he's still the best left tackle in football, something like sounds that. Sounds about right. 37 yeah. sounds right. He can have, meanwhile, it's funny. He and uh, he and David Bakhtiari got. Basically, actually the same deal. Trent got, I think the 49ers added, I think it was a thousand more. They took Bakhtiari's contract oh, right. and added yeah. like a, a thousand or a hundred thousand a year just yeah. so Trent would one up him. And Bakhtiari just was injured the whole time. The 49ers yeah. got the good investment out of that. No question about that. Now, a lot of people want Bakhtiari here. I I, I don't see it unless it's a mid-season pickup because – Kibitz gets injured and you can just give him right tackle. And right. even then there's some real question marks because he's only played left and um, right. But he's a Bay area guy, Sarah high school, all that. Yep. So I live, I live right there. They've <laughs> right there. They've, they've Maybe we'll see name. him around. Uh, I don't, I don't yep. know where he lives in the off season, but I have seen him around in the Bay every now and again. I'm not sure if he's just home to visit or, or whatever, but that'd be nice, but right. it just doesn't make sense unless Trent is out. Right. Really. And, and I think just to just to close the loop on yeah. free agency so far, um, 49ers, gone. They, yep, they lost Armstead, Sam Darnold, Charlie mm-hmm. Warner, Ray Ray McLeod, Javon Kinlaw, Cleveland Farrell, Oren Burks, Matt Pryor. I don't think any of those. Farrell got one year 3.75 from Washington where you're like, should you maybe have, have just had him back. Yeah. given that to him? He seems like a pretty reliable dude on the edge. You know, it, but if, if you're, you're you're rolling the dice with your two defensive ends right now, and it's it, this is what I keep coming back to. Like, it's a good defensive end first round. It's a good cornerback first round, and it's a good defensive tackle first second round kind of in that region and get the kid from Illinois. You can get the first kid three almost. Yeah. Yeah. And I think it's I think it's probably a deeper defensive tackle, but with corner, yeah. it's pretty top heavy. And with yeah. defensive end, I think it's pretty top heavy. Now you found some guys. We'll always find some guys, but right. I, I think you have day it's, one starters at both yeah. of those, both of those positions, corner and defensive end. So like, problem is you got one first round pick, and so now you're really and you rolling. Probably the dice. want to use it on offensive line if the right guy is there. And Not that tough. you have to, but yeah, that's that's where I that's where I'm at. So it's like. They still haven't answered the questions enough to where it's kind of obvious where they would go in the yeah. first round. It still feels like they need players in the first round as opposed to want players in the first round. I think right. that's a big difference. It And it seems like there's one or two moves to come, I think. Safety. Mm-hmm. Because here's the thing. If, you're, if you've got you Ambry Thomas... There at least. Right. If you've got Ambry Thomas... Daryl Luter and Yadam fighting for that other cornerback spot. Right. I don't feel enthralled about that, but Nor there's at be. least like an open competition for three guys. Mm-hmm. 
but I, it still feels like a position where you'd like to bring in a top heavy, like say Tredavious White, who Mooney Ward is the same agent and is, you know, stumping for. I'm not saying that has to be the guy, and but and that'd be he, tough because I, you, you, anyone you'd bring in, I think now outside of like a Stefan Gilmore, but even if, you know, like anyone who's still available, there's got to be question marks about this can't just yep. be a money thing. And so now you're in a, maybe it's still a three man competition. You drop out Luter, you drop out Thomas, you drop somebody out of that three man rotation that you just mentioned, but it's still a training camp thing. Whereas, right. You, you, okay, defensive end, there's not really a training camp thing, but you need more talent there. Defensive tackle is not really a training camp thing, but you definitely meet, need more talent there. And there's not a clear number two. So, I mean, again, you can bring in a, a number two right. corner in theory in the draft, but you still are going to have a competition in year one with Thomas getting a chance to hold this job, with Luter getting a chance to show his progression, with any, you know, with, with, with the new guy from the Saints getting a chance to show that he's the guy. Like, it's still a competition. Um, right. So it's just a question of maybe where you need it most. I would probably say DT, but I think yeah. cornerback is very close. And then everyone, listen, no one's going to argue against the 49ers taking an offensive lineman, especially if it's an offensive lineman who you can get something from at guard this year or tackle this year. Right. And then can progress into something larger down the line. There's just still a lot. Somebody with athleticism that translates, you know. But and it should, uh, be, it should be clear with offensive line as we get into this. I'll, I'll give you my three guys here in a second. Yeah, that's it what should I'm be clear with for. offensive line. Like that is a really tough position to draft. I know yeah. that. Like if, if there's been two trends of the last five years, it might even be ten. Which is, if you need a wide receiver for this year, you can draft one. You're not going to get yep. it right 100 percent of the like. Not everyone's gotten it right. Um, Eagles got it wrong with Rager and stuff, but like. There's so many good wide receivers coming out because the entire college game is about wide receivers. And at the same time, if you need an offensive lineman for this year, you better sign one because you can't go into the draft with the confidence unless you have a top 10 right. pick. Unless, yeah, unless it's somebody who's got polished, like Fautanu, the guy I was talking about, he yeah. has like trap snatch technique where you're like, oh, yeah. that day one, that translates. And, and even he's going to go like 11th. Time. Right. Like he's like, going to go top 15. And even those guys that are elite, like Rashawn Slater, I think it took him some time. Like, and he's took him a year. outstanding. Yeah. yeah, but it takes all of them. It's just a hard position to learn. It's hard to get accustomed. Like Trent Williams, half a year. It took it. it, it, it you look at uh, um, uh, what's his name? Um, Andrew, geez, Louise. He's the tackle for the Giants. Uh, Andrew Thomas. Oh, Andrew Thomas. He was terrible his first year. Awful. Awful. And then now he's one of the better tackles in football. Like it's going to take a while right. because these guys are not. Outside of one school, in my opinion, these guys are not being taught how to actually play offensive line in the NFL. They're getting taught to play what is essentially seven-on-seven seven flag football with offensive right. linemen. And it makes defensive ends look really good. It makes you know quarterbacks, you know, get this is the inflation. And so you have to understand right. sort of, you know, when a baseball team signs a guy from Korea. You go, well, okay, he's performed in Korea, or he's performed in Japan, he's performed in these leagues, but there is a coefficient that you have right. to add to it because Trim Williams even talked about his rookie year he like didn't realize because he relied on physicality athleticism right. and it worked right. for him in college and then he got to the NFL and I think he said he faced Marcus Ware yeah and then he went oh no yeah I got I need to prep. learn how to play the position and and he he recalled like going up to Chris Furster and being like you got anything for me and he's like nope Good luck. <laughs> yeah, but Demarcus you know? Ware and that spin move is maybe a one of one like that. I get, right, but, right. You know, if the old the old adage is uh, learn the rules as an amateur so you can break them as a professional. Like, it, in a weird way, it's been totally reversed at the offensive line position in college, where it's just guys out there just breaking rules, doing whatever they need to do, just make the play. You know, pass happy league, everything spread out. Uh, just just go out there and, and be a better player than the guy across from you. You don't need the technique or yep. anything. And by the way, it's an issue with defensive ends, I would argue, where they don't have the technique. It's all just athleticism. And it's just dudes running. Again, seven on seven, but it's 11 on 11. It's that kind of temperament. Um, and then they have to learn how to play the position at the at the NFL level. So it's something to keep in mind if you're thinking, yep. hey, how are we going to handle this? Let me give you some names. Let me give you, let me give you a three-round mock draft for the 49ers at 31, yeah. 63, and 94. Are you ready for some Ennis Rakestraw, cornerback mm. out of Missouri? 
Very on brand number, for deer. At number 31. Listen, I, I've watched a lot of Ennis Rakestraw. And if you're going back to a cover three system where you got guys bumping in coverage, press off the line, physicality is everything. You're going to push that. You're going to work that five yard cushion for illegal contact all the way to about seven or eight yards. Yep. Right, you know how teams are constantly pushing offensive linemen downfield and just hoping to get away with it. That's how the 49ers want to play at cornerback. And it's you know, everyone goes, Well, Richard Sherman didn't do that, he played off coverage. Well, Richard Sherman knew the play, so he could do whatever right. the hell he wanted. But when right. Richard Sherman no longer knew the plays, then he was getting burned over the top. And this Rakestraw, I'm not going to compare him to Richard Sherman, but it's clear that he's watched a lot of Richard Sherman, and he's somebody who I think is a very instinctual player. Mm -hmm. He's somebody who can lock down a side of the field. And if nothing else, he is going to chip away at the confidence and the physical, uh, just the physical nature of any wide receiver that he's going up against. And I think as a number two with Mooney on the other side, that's yeah. a really good thing to have because they've tried it the other way. They've tried to just win with technique and physic and, uh, and physical skill set as opposed to actual physicality. Like Ambry yeah. Thomas Rakestraw, is out there. Rakestraw, from what I've seen, puts his body on the line. Like, And I feel like Mizzou is built like that. Like they just get guys who are maybe three stars who, right. who just want to like dive head first into a tackle. Mizzou produces and, the crazy that you need to play in the right. NFL. Right. They might not have the most physical, the best physical skills. They're pretty damn physical and, and pretty, pretty incredible. Like that is know, a, that you, is an important distinction, though. Like Solomon Thomas. Physical traits, not physicality. That's right. You know, so like there's a difference there. And if you're thinking about just number two corner, if you're just thinking about these next two years, I think Ennis Rakestraw getting into the mix would be a real win at 31. And I think he'll be there at 31 because I he do will. think that there's a couple of top guys. Then there's about a 10 pick drop off. And then in that late first round, early second round, there's going to be a bunch of guys to go. And there's some really right. good players. I don't think Rakestraw is the be-all to end all there. I think they can go in a lot of different directions. But it seems to me as if he fits what the 49ers want Agreed. to do. And we'll tap back into sort of that that physical thing. That's how Mooney plays. I think Rakestraw can play the same way. And uh, then you get Lenore, who's going to be really physical there. If this is a team that's going to have to be secondary first, and that's going to have to be where the kind of defense is defined, I think that having a dude who's out there looking for blood at corner two is a, a really, really good option. So I like I Ennis agree. Rakestraw. Even though I'm a Chris Abrams Drain fan, the other Missouri corner who I think could go in the second round, and I thought about maybe holding off and taking him in the second. And I want one of those two Missouri corners. I mean, yep. and it's not that's not just a personal bias. It's just because I watch. I mean, I don't need to watch tape on these guys. I watch them every day. I think about them all week. Missouri football is my thing. And these these are the two best corners that Missouri's had ever, and both of them were game changers. Depended on the week, yep. on who was going to be the dude, but you didn't want to throw to the outside against Mizzou. And there's a reason they won the Cotton Bowl this past year. I like that selection. I think I think as far as him being available, there's going to be an early run on QBs. Somebody's probably going to take JJ McCarthy earlier than expected. There's going to be a run on too. offensive tackle. Yep. You know, um, and yeah, I I think that's a good spot for him. Uh, I think he's a he's a little bit undersized. I think okay. if if I'm correct, but I think when you look at guys who are undersized, what you worry about is are they going to physically commit? Do they have the ability to get dirty, be a dog? You know, kind of like Lenore. Mm -hmm. And I see it with Rakestraw. And I think yeah, you want a guy that has that physical mindset to them. And I think that's a pick that makes a lot of sense. Let's talk about pick number sixty three. And we've talked a lot about defensive tackle and how they need to add defensive tackle depth at the very least, if not somebody who can give you serious snaps from the jump. And a lot of people love Devondre Sweat out of Texas. I love DeAndre De Sweat out of Texas. He's awesome. And he's that sort of grizzly bear that you're looking for. He's a freak of nature. There's a reason that he's not going in the first round, though. It's because right. he, he's he's just it's a little squatty. I mean. I don't like nitpicking on him because he's a really good player for what he is, but he's not a three down player. I don't know if Rook, and I'm told I'm pronouncing this correctly, a row, a row, which by the way, just take him on principle. Rook, a row, a row must be taken. I just, I need, I want that in my life. Regardless, Rook, a row, a row. We're talking about scheme fit. We're talking about guys that the 49ers like. 
They have enough of a track record. We know what they're into. This dude fits the bill to a T. I don't think he actually plays the position that I think the 49ers need him to play. Agreed. I don't think anybody does. Where you get that true one technique, wide wingspan, not getting a lot of penetration, but he's never getting pushed back. Just hold the line, Hagrid at the door, all that. That's not what this guy does. What he does is exactly what the 49ers always want their defensive tackles to do, which is split gaps and have crazy explosion off the line. And I think he's a pretty sure tackler in the backfield. Rook Aroro yeah. out of Clemson. He's, he's almost built more like a defensive end. Like that's the sort of athleticism and physicality he has. Mm -hmm. But I think the way he uses that physicality, that pure athleticism to burst out of a stance and disengage he disengages yeah. really well like he right. rips tackles to get inside right. and i think that sort of is what you want in a guy that's a three technique is to have that athleticism to basically basically have like borderline defensive end athleticism mm -hmm. and just not get pushed back far enough in the run game where you can use your eyes stay upfield disengage and go make a play or just fly off the line and create you know put offensive linemen in conflict yeah. especially if he's running a stunt and you're just, you know, he might oh. split the stunt because he has that so sort fun of in stunt. He'd be so fun. In oh, my stunt. God. I just love talking about stunts, by the way. But, yeah, he, he gives you so much athleticism, so much flexibility. I think regardless of, of whether he's the ideal, like, one tech you want or fit, I just think there's a spot for him. Any like you could you could put him in a lot of places on this offense on this defensive line, mm -hmm. and he's going to cause some problems. He's he's just got the burst and the number that you always want to look at. If you don't know already, if you're listening to this podcast or watching it for the first time on YouTube, the only number that you really need to look at to understand where the 49ers want to go with defensive linemen in general, and especially in the interior, is broad jump. Yeah. And with the broad yeah. jump, I'm circling it right here. 116 inches. That's 95th percentile of all defensive tackles. I can even give you interior defensive line, 95th percentile. Defensive line in general, 74th percentile at 294 pounds and six foot four. So again, not the biggest guy, but when you watch him, but he's always enough. in the backfield. And people yep. talk, people have been talking a lot about like DJ Jones, who it does sound like he's going to stay with the Broncos, all this. But when they Niners clearly needed defensive tackles before the Malik Collins trade, when it was just Jordan Elliott, people are like, well, go back to DJ Jones. Well, what was DJ Jones's game? Now, he's shorter, and he weighed yep. about the same. He's squattier. But DJ Jones's game was he burst off the line, he got into the backfield. You're stopping the run not through technique and size. You're stopping the run through burst and athleticism. That's how the 49ers want to do it. Right or wrong, that's how they want to do it. This guy fits the bill. To a T, I was like legitimately stunned because I, I was watching him and I go, hmm, this seems very Niners like. I yep. wonder what his broad jump is. Then you look at the broad jump and you go, yeah, okay. It doesn't, it's not that complicated sometimes. And he'll be there at 63, presumably. If you need to trade a fourth round or fifth round pick to move up to get him, go ahead. I don't know if you that's you, that's a spot that yeah. second round pick to me. If they're gonna move so up, I, I think that's a spot for it. It's so big too. Because you you have to answer some questions, right? So what what's the basic structure of draft picks? You know, if you're taken on day one, you need to be on the field day one. Yep. If you're taken on day two, you need to have a, a down that you can perform at, whether that be special teams or just situational play. Like you need to be on the field for something. And then day three is just crapshoots. And you hope that one of them turns into a star and you're going to cut a couple of guys probably within a year or two. Like, that's just how it is. There's a reason that they're taken on day three. If they were any sort of a sure bet, they would be available or they'd be taken much earlier. Uh, Ruka Roro -Ro isn't going to be everyone's cup of tea, but he's the 49ers cup of tea. And I think 63 is a really nice spot to take a guy who's a perfect fit. And I think has the production at the college level. He's a Clemson guy. You know, they like them. Um, it might not be the Raiders with Mike Mayock where they only took Clemson guys, but uh, Clee, Clee Farrell certainly showed him something this past year for Clemson guys. Uh, they like taking guys from premier programs. Uh, they trust that those guys, you know, I don't know. I presume he was a four or five star coming out of school. Rook Aroro -ro at number 63. And then I'm kind of torn on my third round pick. This would be pick number 94. We've talked before on the show about Mason McCormick. 
guard out Beefy of boys uh, uh, South Dakota State. Go Jacks! I love him. I think he's the kind of you know gritty dude. Third round, you're just going to get something from him. Um, if Banks has been too soft and uh, and Burford has been too inconsistent. I just think that you just maybe you, you, you limit your cap, you limit your ceiling on a dude. You just take mm-hmm. a guy with a high floor. And even though he went to South Dakota State, I think Mason McCormick has a really high floor. He just looks like he knows what the hell he's doing. Also, also with the way that the interior offensive line market's exploding, it's mm-hmm. pretty good business to just say, "Good call." Do we really want to pay Banks a second contract? And maybe they do. Maybe Banks takes a leap this year, right. gets fully healthy, and 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 grows. We'll see. There have but, been moments where you you can see him making some money. Right. But it's a position where if you can avoid paying a guard, especially when you're going to have to pay IU and Purdy, mm-hmm. and you just keep bringing them in and, and add, and worst case, you have depth. Offensive linemen get hurt. It's a rough, rough life. Yeah. Take a guard. Take an interior offensive lineman. It's it's somewhat paradoxical because, as I was saying earlier, like offensive linemen are not being taught how to play the game especially on the interior, the right way. And that's why so many teams are taking tackles and converting them to guards because at right. least you know, you, you f- you're you going to have to do some work with them regardless of what position. You might as well teach them a position that they can play. You know, you, you're know, you going to have to teach them no matter what. Everyone has to sort of take a redshirt year. I don't know if you'd have to with Mason McCormick. I, I've watched some more tape on him. I, I just think he's ready to go. I think that it's a high floor, low ceiling sort of player. Add him into the rotation. If you got by with John Feliciano, who did resign, and that's a good resigning, you got something there. And if you want to do something with a red shirt on him, teach him how to play center. <laughs> you know, do something like yep. that. At the same time, I'm torn because I think Zach Zinter out of Michigan, who was their right guard this past season, might be there at 94. And Zach Zinter's so good. Zach Zinter's so good that when I I was going through names, I go, oh, Zach Zinter. He'll be what, like a early second round pick? And then I'm starting, you know, look around. The mock drafts aren't anything really, but the people who I think know what they're talking about have him around this range. And yep. it's like, you should take Zach Zinter there. Zach Zinter, I don't remember a bad rep from him all year. And we all watched a lot of Michigan football just based on what they did this past season. And the team that I was talking about earlier, college team that I was talking about earlier, that actually teaches their guys how to play offensive line for the NFL, Jim Harbaugh's Michigan Wolverines. Now, I don't know if that's going to be the case moving forward under Sherrod Moore, but like th- that offensive line actually played NFL offensive line at the college Correct. level. And there's a reason they were the best offensive line in college football this past season. Zach Zinter, if he's there at 94, as much as I love Mason McCormick, you just take him. You just take him because For sure. he's Zach Zinter, God damn it. I'm with you. I, I think. And it's and it's almost like you don't want to just say any guy from this program that played in this in this offense, any guy on the offensive draft. line, <laughs> yeah. But this offensive line, they know what they're doing. And Chris Furster is an excellent teacher, but he's, you know, I think wouldn't about, he want a guy if, who doesn't have? Think about what he could do with a guy who already knows what the hell he's doing. Exactly, exactly what I was going to say. Take it to like the next it's level. just so much easier. Like even here's the thing: you get a lot of these athletic tackles, a lot of these prospects that are balls of clay. They take, like we said, they take time to develop. Sometimes it's a two-year process. Sometimes it's more than that. Like sometimes, or they just don't develop. When you have a guy, especially in the third round, third round is a spot where it's like either you're taking a guy who's flawed and has Mm -hmm. crazy athletic upside, and that's why he wasn't round one or round two, or you're taking a guy who's solid and knows what he's doing, and you're thinking day one, this guy's going to work, and I think that's Zinter. Yeah, I'm 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 a big fan of, of what he did. Listen, uh, he, we we don't have like any athletic test scores or anything from him, at least with mock draftable. But just watch, put on any Michigan game, look at the right guard, mm-hmm. and then forget about him because whoever's going up against him lost every time. He's so technically sound. Uh, I'm sure there are people who can get into the nitty gritty on it who have watched more than me. But again, I. I it, I can just go through my notes every now and again. And I've written down Zach Zinter three times throughout the season. Just as here's somebody to watch coming out of the right. draft. Kingsley Sulamata is another guy that I did very early in the season. I watch a BYU game and I go that one. Like it doesn't have to be that complicated. Sometimes we'll make it complicated. Day three. I love getting complicated. 
I love it's important to make it complicated, but like, cause you're, you're having to talk yourself into it. I don't think that you should overthink a Zach Zinter sitting there at 94 because it's 94. And yes, that is, it's a top hundred pick. It's important. It matters. You need to get them right. I'd feel a lot more comfortable about getting it right with a dude who just didn't do anything wrong this past season than not. Now I'll say this. I don't know if that fulfills the mandate that I think the fan base has put out there for offensive line. Cause now you're just adding another guard and they're fine at guard. What they need is a future right tackle and Zach Zinter and Mason McCormick are not right. going to do it. So, but once you get into round three, it's like a little tougher to find those guys. So don't you just want an offensive lineman that can produce, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so that's where I'm at. I'm going to go Ennis Rakestraw with pick 31, Ruka Roro Row at, at 63. And I think I'm just going to go with Zinter at 94 if he's there. And if not, you go with Mason Love McCormick. I, I, I feel really good about that. It's like, here's the thing. Even if you're not getting that tackle, you still have McKivitz for another year. That's right. Right? You still have Banks for another year. Burford, maybe he takes a step. Probably not, but I'm not going to discount it. You, you've got Feliciano, you can plug and play. I think Brendel, I think he's going to be a free agent. Um, or maybe I, I'm wrong about Banks and he does become a free agent. But that way you have a guard who can fill in. If you do lose Banks and right. your interior offensive line has somebody who's reliable, who you're not that worried about, and you can take a swing on a tackle later in the draft, or you, know, you say in the offseason, you pay for it or you pay for a swing tackle, or you make a trade for a guy who's a cast-off, and you do it that way. Obviously, drafting a tackle, I think, is the ideal way to go, but mm -hmm. you don't want to just take a swing on somebody if he's not the right pick. I'm just looking at, um, is it Dane Bruglers? No, Nick Bumgarner at The Athletic, who does do a very nice job with his mock drafts. And uh, The Athletic, I'll say, NFL Network and The Athletic, I think, do the best job with this sort of stuff because they're very serious about it. There's a lot yeah. of first round talent, top 10 talent at offensive line, right? You got uh, Fugawa out of Oregon State. You got uh, Fantanu out of Washington, uh, JC Latham out of uh, Alabama, uh, Fashanu out of, out of Penn State. I mean, these are all guys who can go in the top 10. They won't because there's just too many of them. But Tyler Guyton out of Oklahoma is a top 20 pick. Um, Graham Barton is one, one of these lineman. guys is, is probably going to fall. You know, right. there's, Marius, there's Marius so Mims many. out of out of Georgia, six seven three forty would be a really cool one, um, but he'll probably go. I mean, someone's going to bet on the upside. Uh, Jordan Morgan out of Arizona, right. who I'm not the biggest fan of, if I'm being honest. Um, I'm I've been trying to figure him out. I'm not quite there yet. I think that's a better way of putting it. <laughs> Thank you for that. Like all of those guys are probably going to be gone before the Niners go at thirty one. So if you really like one of them, maybe you can trade up. It's going to cost you. I look at yep. the second round here yeah, where they do a good job of of being, you know, I think the athletic does a really good job of telling you kind of where guys should go regionally. There's two offensive tackles in the second round, and there's one in the third round that's draftable. There's a lot of guards, but there's one. I mean, Blake Fisher out of, out of uh, Notre Dame mocked here at, at 66 to Arizona. That's the last offensive tackle off the right. board. In and the there's, first and there's guys that are like Mims and Guyton and Patrick Paul yeah. who are, and, and your guy out of Yale, uh, here in a mega DJ, um, right. or I'm, or maybe I'm mixing that up The B I'm mixing up the, the Yale guy, Kieran, oh, Kieran, Omega DJ. Kieran, a mega DJ out of Yale tackle. Yeah. And then the BYU Kingsley Suma, Suamatia. So there's like a yeah. bunch of guys who have like true tackle frames that are projectable at the position where you go. I did not love what I saw out of them out of college, but you just say, all right, by you year two, yeah. maybe they're going to figure it out. We don't need them to start day one. So maybe I you just, go I, that route. I would rather I take know. a swing at two guys on day three in that regard. Yeah. I would rather, because again, we should be clear here. Like they've gotten away with it with, day three pick at, at right tackle. They got away with it. And by the way, he was like just as good, if not a little better this past season. And he wasn't great. Was I don't even know if he qualifies good. But the last right tackle got paid $18 million a year to go play for Denver. And 
you're getting you're getting a guy on a, yeah. on a on a song to do the exact same thing for you. So with the inflation across the league, especially at guard, I'm glad you noted it. You should just be taking swings at dudes, but you do need somebody who can get into the rotation this year. If that falls right. to you at 31, go to town because I, I think that there's a you know I think you can get Chris Abrams drain in the second or third round. I think you can agreed. You can get defensive tackles that fit your scheme, which is not going to be everyone's cup of you know cup of tea in the second or third round. Like I, I feel like you can still do stuff there. What you clearly can't do is get somebody who you can reasonably start at right tackle in year one right. where the 49ers are drafting. If they want to do that, if they honestly right. want to do that, they need to be in the 20s, and I think early 20s, and then you're still getting like the fifth or sixth option. And then, yeah, and and may, maybe that's what they do. Maybe they they trade up, but there's a pr- – even in to get to the bottom of the 20s is a serious premium that I don't think they're going to want to pay. I think moving up in the second round, closing the gap, but or – Closing the gap between that second and third round pick make a lot more sense. I think they're going to move up at some point, but that first round premium, I kind of st- think that they're going to stick at thirty one. It just Unless, cost, um, yeah. It just cost the Vikings a uh, forty two, one eighty eight, and a second round in twenty twenty five to move to number twenty two. So that was to move up twenty spots. It cost you the the inherent pick. 188 and a second rounder for next year. That's that's to move up 20 spots into number 22, which then they'll probably package together with their pick. I think it's 11 to go get a QB. Right. Imagine trading up for JJ McCarthy. Couldn't be me. Couldn't be me. Uh, yeah. Jake, anything you want to tell the people before we get out of here? Because I'm excited for your your three round mock draft on Wednesday As or Thursday. I. We'll find out. All I'd tell you, uh, fine folks, is is keep following us. We are we're back. And we mean it this time. Um, that sounded a little bit like a threat, but like a soft threat. And that's that's kind of yeah. what we're going for here. Soft uh, if power. You want, right, right. Just and not like Roger Goodell, which is hard. Okay. okay. I'm gonna I'm getting a little yeah, I'm getting a little carried away here. But if you want more deranged rambling takes, but also decent deranged analysis. That's right. That is pertaining to the 49ers draft, especially with free agency, most of it sorted out. We're gonna get deeper and deeper into the draft. We're gonna get weird. We're gonna get really into it, and we're gonna we're gonna publish twice a week. That's right. We're on it. It might not be Sunday and, and Wednesday every week, but it will be twice a week. We'll be here. Stick around with us. We're weirdos. I hope you're weirdos too, and uh, join the weird party we got going on here. Sounds good, man. Nothing to add to that. All right, for Jake, I'm Dieter. We'll talk to you later this week. Jake's mock draft coming. If you ever needed a, a tease to get you to the next episode, that's it. Uh, until then, have a good one.